Hi, Mystery Knox listeners, and welcome or welcome back to the podcast. For today's case, we're going to tell you about a young girl whose life was stolen from her at just 11 years old. This is the case of Shannon Nicole Polk. All right, Mary, we are back. Sort of. Sort of. (laughs) No, we are back. (laughs) We are back. We won't chit chat too much today because, you know. I'm in pain. (laughs) Mary's in pain, but we're trying to get this done so we can get this out in October, like we said. Uh. Um, But anyway, yeah, just know that we're back. We're excited. We are, yeah, back to it. And just real quick, Mary, Hmm. really quick. um, What did you think of the case real quick? Um, it just seemed like it it could have been an open and shut thing, but it's not like it was, it, it seemed almost easy, but it's not. And, um, I don't know. Yeah, I would actually agree with that. Like, I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't 1975, you know, yeah. it was 2001. And really, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, to us, I think that yeah. doesn't seem like that long ago. It, I mean, it kind of is, though. Like, it's 23 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, jeez. I know. No, it, for us, anyway, it doesn't seem I that know. long. Um, no, not at all. I was like, oh, 2001? That was like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that long ago. And then it's like, wait. Wait shit. a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, to us, it doesn't seem like that long ago. But, I mean, it really, I guess it kind of was. But, mm-hmm. um. But still, back in 2001, you know, they used DNA evidence, I guess, is the mm-hmm. point I'm getting to. Like, yeah. it wasn't, like I said, back in the day, way back in the day, where they had no idea about what they were doing with, with DNA. So, but of course, it could also be due to, like, the police, uh, is it force? I don't know. <laughs> the police department yeah. um, and who they had. I mean, granted, they did have a good amount of people helping for this search. Mm-hmm. I mean, to search for her and... um it just, I don't know, because given where the location of it, it might have had that sort of, you know, it's Alabama. But again, right. I don't know, because some places have more, I guess, people and more uh, mm-hmm. resources and just just everything, whereas opposed to like country versus city sort of thing is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I know, because, like, going into this case, I was a little bit worried. I was like, I don't, I'm finding some stuff, but not a whole lot. And that's the other thing, too, where you expect some cases like this to have more light shine upon it. But obviously, you know, there wasn't that much. But we found a a pretty substantial amount of information, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. And regarding that, I just want to shout out, because I got a lot of um, quotes and stuff from this podcast because Mm -hmm. it's called a cold truth podcast you can find it i found it on youtube but i think they're everywhere like like we are on all the podcast sites mel who's the host she actually interviewed like a bunch of shannon's family and friends and stuff and so all the quotes Mm -hmm. maybe not all the quotes but most of the quotes i use from friends and family are from her podcast so and i found out a lot of information on that like from her podcast that I did not find in the source material, like other sources. So just yeah. shout out to Cold Truth. She goes in depth. If you guys want to learn more about Shannon's case after you listen to this, I seriously recommend her. Well, with that being said, let's get to the case. August 16th, 2001 started off as just another ordinary day in Prattville, Alabama. 11-year-old Shannon Polk was enjoying her summer break, along with her older sister, Lisa. Shannon was one of those kids who was very outgoing, kind, and loved meeting new friends. Shannon's mother stated, She never met a stranger. She had a heart of gold and just loved people, all people, and everybody loved her. Shannon and her sister lived in the Candlestick Mobile Home Park with their mother, Marie Stroud. This mobile home park was described as a very tight-knit community. So Mary, I'll go ahead and send you a photo of the layout of the mobile home park so you can follow along if you want to. 
Um, and then for the listeners, this will be on our blog at mysterynoxpodcast.wordpress.com. I cannot talk if you want to take a look. I didn't think that trailer park was that huge, to be honest. Yeah, it kind of is, right? And it was very, like, a little bit more spread out. Or maybe that's mm-hmm. just how they are. Um, so there was only one entrance and exit, and that was from the main road that went into the park. It did have, like, a like a little roundabout area where there was, like, a pond, I guess you could say, um, towards the front. And then from there, you would come to all the separate dead-end streets. And on all of those streets, there were trailers. Now, there were also some trailers, if I remember correctly, on the main road as well. Like, the main entrance road. Yeah. Okay. And, fun fact, all the streets were named after baseball teams. Which I thought was weird, but (laughs) I don't know. I was like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, they must like their their baseball. Yeah, that's what I thought. So, yeah, I guess they were a very baseball-oriented town. Or at least trailer park i don't know yeah the the person who runs the mobile home Mm -hmm. and then towards the back of the mobile home park was a creek and a railroad track with a ravine on the other side of the community there were some woods and then there's also a rundown warehouse building on the other side of the trailer park and shannon used to play over there sometimes with her friends Quote, Shannon lived on Expo Street, which was in the back northwest corner of Candlestick. The mobile home park had block parties, neighbors watched out for each other and each other's children, and overall, Candlestick was supposed to be a very safe community. In fact, according to the podcast Cold Truth, Shannon's mom moved to Candlestick because it was supposed to be a safer area than they previously lived in. There was actually an incident that happened once where Shannon and her friend strayed a little too far from home while playing one day and ended up at a park. Someone from the neighborhood saw them and told them to go back home, then called the girl's parents to let them know. So this is just one piece of evidence to show that this community really was looking out for each other and looking out for other people's children. Well, I do know that, um, like, a lot of like southern and east coasters um from what i've seen anyway they like to hang out like on the porch like i've never it's like freaking hot and they're out there just hanging out you know and i'm just like nah, i'll stay inside an ac and peep at you through the blinds like a creep you know but that's yeah that's good that they're yeah making their presence you know unfortunately even the safest places can have wolves hiding in sheep's clothing and on the day shannon disappeared there was no good neighbor around to stop it I think that was weird. I mean, we'll talk about that later, but I found that to be so strange. Me too. That Thursday morning, Marie headed off to work like usual at around 5.30 a.m. and left Shannon and Lisa at home in the mobile home park. She had no idea this would be the last time she ever saw her daughter Shannon alive. Lisa awoke at around 9 a.m. from the TV blaring and the telephone ringing, and she noticed that Shannon was already gone. This was not unusual. Shannon was typically up earlier than Lisa and outside playing or exploring. And I can relate to that for sure. And Mary, I'm sure you can do. You can too. Like when we were kids, I, we were always outside. Yeah, I was outside. Like when the sun, the sun starts setting, that's when you know to head back. Or if you hear your mom mm-hmm. yelling. Exactly. And especially when they use your first and middle name. It was kind of the same with them. Um, even in 2001... The day was hot, sunny, and balmy, a blistering 90 degrees to be exact. According to a source from the Facebook group for Shannon's case, at around 7.45 a.m., Shannon went to a neighbor's house to see if she could play. The neighbor had to go on an errand with her father, so she wasn't able to. I just want to make it clear that this timeline statement and the next few are from the Facebook group, and it has been 22 years since these events have happened. So take these with a grain of salt. According to another neighbor, around 10 a.m., Shannon went to her house to ask for a ride to the gas station, I believe to get candy. The neighbor said no, her daughter was asleep, but to come back. Shannon never did. At 11.45, she goes to another neighbor's home to hang out. Apparently, Shannon was really close with this older woman, and I, I didn't write this, but I think her name was Miss Mary is what they called her. 
But yeah, they were really close. And so she would go and hang out at her home sometimes. Unfortunately, on this day, the neighbor had a doctor's appointment to get to. And I made a note here because I just wanted to say, like, she's gone to, what, three people's houses so far? Yeah. And they have all been busy. What are the odds that everybody she visited was busy? Yeah. It's like you were saying. It's like fate aligned, but for all the wrong reasons. Like, I just... When I was, like, researching this and reading about all these places she went to, let's hang out. No, I have this. No, I have this. No, I have this. I just, I feel so fucking bad for her. Shannon's best friend was also in the mobile home park that day. When asked about the last time she saw Shannon, she stated the day before Shannon disappeared, she said bye to Shannon because her family was moving. The next day, on the 16th, They went back to the candlestick park to pick up a few things and also so her little sister could say bye to Shannon. She knocked on Shannon's door and her older sister Lisa answered, but stated Shannon wasn't there. Unfortunately, the friend didn't remember the exact time that this was, but she stated, My mom is an early bird, so I know it was in the morning. It was before lunchtime, I know that. Also, this seems random, but it does come into play later on in the case. At this point, Shannon was seen with a baby walker. All the other times before this visit at 11.45 a.m., she was not seen with a baby walker. And she had this walker because her baby nephew was staying with them at this point in time. According to the podcast Cold Truth, the last family to see Shannon alive were neighbors that actually lived on the same street as her, Expo Street. This family consisted of two young boys, a mom, and a dad. And get this. The dad was a Prattville police officer. Now, according to this family, Shannon had stopped by and the two boys answered the door. At this point, the dad came to the door and told Shannon she needed to go home because he had to leave for work. This was the last time that we know of that anyone except Shannon's killer saw her alive. Now, stay with me here. Do you remember the baby walker I told you about? At around 1.15 p.m., when the dad, so the police officer, was about to leave for work, he apparently saw the walker laying on the road by the curb of another neighbor's house. Some people think that this is proof that Shannon was grabbed on the road, but we'll talk about that more in theories. At 2.30, Marie arrived home from work. Shannon was not there, but she wasn't worried. So again, this wasn't unusual for Shannon. She was usually off playing with her friends or visiting friends at their homes in the neighborhood. So Marie goes, she runs a few errands, and then at around dinner time, she starts getting a little worried because Shannon still isn't home. Uh, And that's kind of what we were saying earlier, Mary, about, you know, we used to play, but we would be home by dinner time, before dark for sure. When 7 p.m. rolls around, Marie starts searching for Shannon. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more in detail about the search for Shannon. At 7 p.m., Marie goes around the community and knocks on doors asking everyone if Shannon is there and or if they have seen her. Some of the neighbors join in on the search. Around an hour later, Shannon's dad, Billy, is informed. Now, he and Marie were divorced and he was living in Eufaula, Alabama, which is about two hours away from Prattville. And this just, like, ugh, gets me in the gut when I hear it and when I found it out. He was actually due to pick up Shannon the next day for his weekend visit. So around 8.45 p.m., Shannon's two aunts and two uncles came to help with the search, but no one was finding anything. Marie, understandably, was starting to panic. And then at 9 p.m., they went ahead and called the police. Um, So I found this interesting. Um, So according to one of Shannon's aunts, the police came and they took statements from Shannon's mom. However, in the middle of this, they got another call and they left. I was like, what? (laughs) Because all the other research materials and like source materials... Most of them were like, oh, yeah, the police took this so seriously at first. No, I don't the think they did. And but see. Yeah, but then I find out yeah. from her aunt that, like, yeah. that's not true. And Shannon, and this is, I think this is going off 
Shannon as well, where she would just go off and play with her friends and they come back, you know, later. So it wasn't really a big deal. Um, so I'm thinking that's what also was going on, or maybe it's just, you know, she got turned around somewhere or hanging out with her friends and, you know, lost track of time sort of thing. Right. And yeah, they definitely could have been, or they probably were thinking that, to be honest, but I don't know. It just, I was like, even if they were thinking that, why would you leave? Like in the middle of a statement. I don't know. It just was like, okay. Mm -hmm. Rub me the wrong way. And I'm pretty sure there's more to it because I don't think they would just up and leave. I mean, something, it probably had to be something like serious for, or maybe I'm just. Maybe. Benefit of the doubt sort of thing, you know? So they leave and then the aunt states, they didn't really take it seriously that something had probably happened. However, apparently a neighbor knew the chief of police personally, and she made a call. After the call, the police came back out and started taking it more seriously. I'm not sure of how many hours passed between the time that the police left and then the time that they came back. So I found that interesting, too. Like, (laughs) they left a neighbor, thank God a neighbor knew the chief of police, and was basically, I'm sure she was like, hey, get back here. Like, we have a missing child. Yeah. So that's what happened. And then they came back. But again, I don't know the exact time that they came back. So I don't, that unfortunately wasn't in the the material. Now, at this point, there really, as we said, there really is no precise timeline anymore that I could find. So a lot of the source material even glosses over the search. Did you notice that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There really were not a lot of, be- of uh, details about the search that I could find. Yeah. Well, again, it, get, it probably comes back to small town, you know? I just wish people would put more details in when they're reporting on a missing person. Because if I had not found this podcast called Truth, like, I would not have half of what I have now. No. Yeah, and that's what, like, when we were doing research, I was like, I don't know, I'm not really finding a whole lot. Um, Mm -hmm. And this, but it it sounded like a case that need to be told. And then I I was like, this, it's kind of, it would suck. It's a bummer. But um, we just had to keep looking. So going forward, we know the police came back that night and started searching for Shannon. I believe this was anywhere from around 10 to 11 when the actual search started. But again, I'm not completely sure. The police did set up a kind of like roadblock according to Shannon's aunt and they did stop people going into the um, mobile home park so if people were coming in they would stop them they also might have which would make sense to me stop people going out supposed to yeah (laughs) yeah you would think that they would but her aunt couldn't verify that but she was for certain they they were stopping people going in because she got stopped Mm -hmm. when she was going in to go help look for Shannon. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know if they were stopping people going out, but I would assume they would because hello, if you're missing from a a mobile home park, you're not just, hopefully you're not just letting people drive out of there. Yeah. I know they do that on base where they stop like traffic coming in and out. And then if a car does go, they search, they search the vehicle. And according to, the Cold Truth Podcast. Thank you very much, Cold Truth Podcast. They interviewed someone in Shannon's family about the search. And this person stated that when the dogs arrived, because they did bring in cadaver dogs, mm-hmm. they went right up to the quote-unquote root beer man's home, who is also known as Jack Gibson, and they started sniffing under his trailer. This went on, according to his family member, quote, for about 45 minutes that's a long time by the way yeah (laughs) to let a dog be sniffing under a trailer yeah like he and i talked about this later but um the dog went sniffing around the house but his main direction and spot that he sat at um was 45 minutes near the trailer yeah he wanted to get under there then the dog hit the railroad tracks and went straight towards county road four they lost the scent there end quote Now, County Road 4 is only a mile away from the trailer home community. This person also stated that when he and a few other people were searching for Shannon the night she disappeared, 
They attempted to drive down County Road 4, and they were shot at in their truck by unknown persons. These people were never found. Which, again, I'm going to say that makes no sense to me, because the police were there. Yeah. They were searching for Shannon, and they're not going to go after these people that were shooting at searchers? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, again, if they're searching in the woods, um, I know that there's a hunting ground over there. Um, But I should think there should be precautions set, you would think, anyway. Um, You would think. (laughs) Yeah, again, this is another, like, question mark. The police also did search Shannon's room, but according to some of her family members, they don't believe they searched her whole house, which I found odd. Mm -hmm. Shannon's aunt stated... We found a notebook where she wrote directions to where County Road 40 was. She also mentioned a red van. We said something to the police about it, and they said that it led nowhere. End quote. However, they don't know when the note was written. That's funny you mentioned red van, because like when I was doing a search, it was a a red Jeep and a white vehicle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, those were just kind of like... No, that doesn't ring a bell, or it doesn't sound familiar, moving on. And I'm just like, what? Really? Yeah. Interesting, interesting. So, I just, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of, like, hmm, they weren't versed in doing a missing persons sort of thing. So that's why there's, there's, like, there's a lot of slack in there, and I'm like, oh my gosh. They probably never got disappearances, really, that often. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I mean, I can understand that, but still, I think you should always be kind of prepared. Um, Yeah, of course. Or at least common sense comes into play. Like, you know, you don't just search a room, you search the whole house, and you search the grounds. Agree. About four days later, after Shannon disappeared, the FBI arrives. There was also a sketch made by a local girl who stated she saw Shannon talking to this man on the day of her disappearance. This sketch was plastered all over the area, but there were no leads. However, in 2017, the girl, now an adult, admitted to the police that she made up the sketch in an effort to help with the investigation. You know what? Karma, I believe. (laughs) Was she not getting enough attention elsewhere? She's like, oh, let me just, you know. Oh my god. I don't understand people like that. Why do people do this because this is not the first time Mm -hmm. i have heard of someone now she was a child but i have heard of adults doing this in cases how does making shit up help with an investigation people yeah please don't do this please don't ever do this because imagine if it was you out there you i mean jesus yeah it's really unfortunate because for 16 years they were circulating this sketch. Mm-hmm. Like, so much evidence, so many things could have gone unnoticed. So many suspects because because of this. All that time wasted is just amazing. Yeah. So please, people, do not, do not, do not do this. The pond was also dragged, but nothing was found. Unfortunately, all the searches for Shannon turned up nothing. Days and then weeks went by, with no word on what happened to Shannon. Then, on October 6, 2001, seven weeks after Shannon disappeared, the world came crashing down for Shannon's family. In an isolated field, 10 miles north of Prattville, near Atuga County Road 66, two rabbit hunters stumbled upon a trash bag that looked odd. Quote, Clifford Ziegler, one of the hunters who found the body, told the Prattville Progress, that he passed the bag multiple times, assuming it was just trash, before he realized what it held. End quote. Inside the bag were Shannon's remains. Her body had been tied up with a rope and wrapped in the trash bag. She was just 11 years old. The thing about that, I was um, watching this one YouTube video. They were saying how the, the hunters, they weren't going to go check it out, but the dogs were very adamant about wanting to get over there. Like, there's something there. And as they were leaving, um, their vehicle wouldn't start. And so they took that as a sign to, all right, let me go, you know, check it out. So both the guys and their dogs went over, and, and that's what they found. Oh, man, that's crazy. 
So I wonder, like, how much longer she would have just remained undiscovered if they had... If they left. Yeah. Yeah. Or, like, would she have been? Because I know it was an open field, Mm -hmm. so what if somebody, you know, plowed it or something? You know what I mean? No, and that was going to happen with the coming weeks, they were saying. That was going to happen. That is just weird. Like, all these little missed things. And it's just unfortunate that it ended up this way, though. Weeks, months, and then years have gone by since Shannon's body was found. The police did put together Shannon's task force in the first few weeks of the search. And as far as I could tell, they still meet up regularly to talk and work on her case. Quote, I want everyone to know this case is unsolved, Shannon's aunt said. The one responsible has never been held accountable. I wonder how many other children he has hurt and murdered. We never thought anything like this could happen to our family, but it did, and we need justice for her. End quote. After the break, we'll discuss what could have happened to Shannon. Before we get into it, was there anything else you wanted to mention? Yeah, just a reminder to everybody to please send in your creepy stories so we can get those into our special Halloween episode that we're going to be doing. And you can send those to Mystery Knox, which is N-O-X podcast at gmail.com. And you can also send a voice memo as well if you don't want to type out your story. And you can... Send that on our website, right? Oh, shoot. Hold on. Podcast. It's, yeah, it's no longer <laughs> Anchor. It's Right. We'll have podcasters. it in the notes. <laughs> yeah, it'll be in the notes if you just want to send a voice message. Oh, which also reminds me, if you are not subscribed on Spotify to our podcast, please go subscribe. Okay, okay. Are we ready to get back into theories? Okay, so I did want to mention that in the Terra Calico case we did a few months ago, we did mention my sister's friend's kid, Kristen Smith, went missing. Uh, She was missing, and we did mention it in that episode. Unfortunately, she was found deceased. You know, I just wanted to mention it to let everybody know, because I know some people were wondering if she had been found or not. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics. The case is still very active. There's a lot of different parts with this case and um, and all of that going on. But yeah, I did just want to mention it so people are updated on Kristen's case. And I do want to send, you know, Mary and I do want to send our condolences to Kristen's family. After reviewing some of the theories, we've come to conclude that there are two basic theories to this case. Either Shannon was taken by someone she knew, or she was taken by a stranger, which I think Shannon being taken by someone she knew is a little bit more plausible. Yeah, I do too. We'll start with the people she knew. The Halloween man. Which he got his name by the Halloween decorations he would hang up around Halloween. Though we haven't come across too much information about him, there was the fact that the walker was just outside his house, which makes it an interesting detail, and makes him a possible suspect. Another person was the police officer, who lived on the corner just one house away. When he left for work that day around 1.15pm, he noticed the walker outside the Halloween man's house. With the mention of the walker, it was also noted that a neighbor had spotted it and ended up taking it home and cleaning it. She thought it was left on the curb for someone to take, and with her being pregnant, she thought it would be of use later. Makes sense. It wasn't until later, when news broke about Shannon, that she returned it to the police. Not long after Shannon disappeared, the police officer was reprimanded for unknown reasons. He also told his family not to talk to anyone about Shannon going missing. Which is kind of weird. So he was the last person to see her, besides the killer. Yeah. He spotted the walker. I don't know. I So what I guess what I was going to say is I do know that Shannon's aunt, because of that interview that I heard with her, she, at least during that interview, she still suspected the police officer mm-hmm. of, of hurting Shannon. But I don't know. Like, I think there's other suspects who are more 
it would fit that category better, I guess you could say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, it's only because about. he was the last person to see to her see that her. kind of is like, oh, it's that's yeah. weird. That's Yeah. He can be a suspect. Yeah, um, for sure. But I do think it's weird that he told his family not to talk to anybody about Shannon. Like, why? Mm-hmm. And we don't know why he was reprimanded. Yeah. Or, I mean, it maybe it wasn't related to the case. Um, or, maybe. I don't know. I mean, there's so... It, within those last two sentences that he was yeah. reprimanded for unknown reasons. And then for his family not to talk to anyone... About Shannon going missing. That's, that's like, that is odd, and especially with him being a police officer, because he knows the system. Like he knows how important it is, how the fir- how important the first like forty eight hours are in a case. Yeah. So wouldn't he want to help in any way he could? You know what I mean? Yeah, or, I don't or know. he maybe he just didn't want that kind of publicity drawn to his family. Maybe, but who knows? Yeah. Another person was Jack Earl Gibson, otherwise known as the Root Beer Man. He got his nickname of the Root Beer Man because he would lure children into his home with root beer and candy. It was also said that he would do that and would take illegal photos of them. He was known to be inappropriate with children. As a result of this, Gibson was arrested and later faced with a thousand child pornography charges. A thousand, bro. That is disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I'm just saying. At that point, I would just take them out back and put them out of their their little existence. Gibson had stated he had not seen Shannon and suggested she was probably out getting candy, which officers found strange as it was 10 p.m. He also told neighbors the next day that she probably went to someone's house. People also found it odd that he never joined in on the search for Shannon. Yep, I would say that's a little strange. Strange. Uh, what 11-year-old would be out at 10 p.m. getting candy by oh. themselves? Oh, that, yeah. Oh, also the search. Yeah, it's a close, tight-knit community. I mean, I would think mm-hmm. that, you know. Yeah, it, I would say it's a little strange that he didn't help. And actually, in when I was researching this, I found out that, like, quite a few neighbors didn't help search for her, which... Mm-hmm. I just find really odd because, like you said, they were a tight-knit community. Pretty much everybody knew everybody in that trailer park home. And so, if uh, if I was in a tight-knit community like that, I would definitely be out searching for a child. Mm-hmm. And I really wouldn't know. <laughs> no, truthfully, And you know? Mary <laughs> has mixed feelings about that. Yeah. Because I, I don't know. If there's a connection... I obviously don't speak for everybody. It's just, you know, me and like-minded folks. But. Yeah. Like, if it's someone. Yeah. (laughs) Like, if it was someone I knew, obviously, I'd be out there. But someone I didn't know, I don't know if I would do that. I don't know. Because that's. I. I, Yeah. Because I've thought about this for ever since we started researching. And we came across, or I came across, um, that little tidbit where him and, you know, a few other people didn't really do that. They didn't participate. Yeah. Yeah. And while I can agree it is strange, I can also agree that it isn't. You know, it's just, it's hard to pinpoint. Um, yeah. But considering I, the fact it was a close-knit community where everyone knew each other, yes, I can say that the, it is weird that you're not participating. Right. But say it's an outsider, I don't know. That, you know. But in this case, yes. Yes, in this case, It's yes. a little strange. At one point, a man with a dog trained in search and rescue volunteered to help with the search. When the dog got a hold of Shannon's scent, he led everyone to the Gibson house, where the dog had stayed for 45 minutes. He wanted to get under the man's trailer. The dog also led the search to the railroad tracks, County Road 4, and ended up at Bubba's Gravel. Even with the search, it gave them no leads. Ty Foster is another individual that never joined in on the search for Shannon. The lack of concern was noticeable. He also pled guilty to assault charges and sodomy involving a nine-year-old boy. When police did a search of his home, they found traces of Shannon's blood. 
Shannon's parents had said Shannon would get nosebleeds, but don't remember her having one while at the foster's home. Here's the thing with this guy. He had kids that were Shannon's age, around Shannon's age. Mm -hmm. And yet, he is still hurting children like this? I don't How fucked that. up do you have to be, dude? I mean, it's bad enough even if you don't have kids. Like, you don't yeah. fucking hurt children. But, like, to have children? And then do it? that? Yeah. I don't understand. What the hell? I, it's interesting because, like, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the camp with, with child molesters and pedophiles and all that shit that they will never change. Yeah. And I say that because, well, look at their history for one. Mm -hmm. But also, I watched a, um, you know, a documentary uh, a few years ago with some, they were interviewing pedophiles, child molesters and all that. And this one guy was, you know, they were in jail, thankfully, but he literally was telling the, the documentary crew, he was like, look, I know what I do is wrong, but I can't not do it. Like, literally, is there something in his brain or in their brain, something is wrong, at least that's what he was saying, that he cannot stop doing it, even though he knows that it's wrong. Hmm. And he said, if you guys let me out of here right now, even though I know it's wrong, I would still go and do it. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. Like, they're not going to stop. So stop letting them out. Mm -hmm. But they still do. I, I just think uh, one and done. You have the evidence. You know it's them. Just be done with it. Kill them. Yeah. I, well, I agree with you there. But <laughs> apparently we're in the minority with that. Where? <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. According to some people I've talked to, they're like, you can't just kill them. And I'm like, well, why not? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. Why do we need people around like that that are doing disgusting, vile, horrible things to children that will carry those scars with them the rest of their lives. Yeah, and we pretty much pay for their housing and food. Yeah, and we have to pay to keep them in prison, yeah. to keep them fed, to keep them And you know, they can have jobs alive. in there? God. Yes, they can have jobs. It's fucked up, dude. That guy's getting an education while your kid is six feet under, and that's if they found him. Yeah. Either six feet under or, you know, suffering for the rest of their life yeah. with these mental health issues now where some kids can't even function anymore, you know, and they're mm -hmm. just, they're prisoners in their own brain. Yeah. So, and that's no sort of life. Yeah. I don't understand people that like want to give those kind of people a second chance. I, I don't understand it. When they th didn't even think that of, of what they were doing to your family member. Yeah, I agree. Like, they didn't give two shits, but, and you're there thinking, oh, they'll they'll change. No, they won't. Yeah. E everyone deserves a second chance. No, they I don't. I don't think so. I don't think they do, no. honestly. But I bet you there's going to be people listening to this that are going to completely disagree with us, and that's totally fine. No, that's fine, yeah. Those are just our opinions. There was something I wanted to bring up, because I thought this was very interesting. So... When I was researching this, I realized when Shannon's body was found, it was found on or by, like, uh, County Road 66. If you remember earlier, I was talking about her journal that her aunt and mom found. Mm -hmm. In the journal, she wrote directions to County Road 40. And along with the directions, she said red van in the journal. County Road 40 is only 13 minutes from County Road 66. I don't know if that's a coincidence. I just found that really, really odd. So I got to thinking, like, well, maybe she was going to go meet somebody. Because, like, Shannon, she was a very trusting child, is the thing. You know, her family constantly says, like, she never met a stranger. She was very loving. She was very friendly. And unfortunately, like, that friendliness could have led to her death, unfortunately. So, um, I don't know. It was just something that was brought up in the research. And it's just something I've been thinking about because I feel like that's too, 
too much of a of a lead or something like that. Like it's it's a co- I don't know. I don't really believe in coincidences when it comes to true crime cases. Mm-hmm. But the police apparently said they checked it out and nothing came of it. So I don't know. Who knows? The second theory is that she was abducted by a stranger. There were three sex offenders listed in the mobile home park, which could be possible suspects. Police have said when sex offenders live so close together, it makes the task of finding and convicting cases that much harder, as they tend to close ranks, provide alibis to each other, and share materials with each other. I forgot what I was going to say there. I don't know, but I think that's weird. Let's compare notes about the people we've, you know, I was just, ugh. Yeah, that's... Share materials. That's disgusting. Yeah. Like, materials? Like, who knows? I mean, I'm sure there's a What does that even mean? Oh, I remember what I was going to say. Did it ever say, like, who the sex offenders were? No. No, it didn't? Okay. So we don't even know, like, if she knew Or at least the ones I came across, the articles and and some of the stuff, I didn't see any mention of anything. But it was known, and it's in there as public record if you go and search the area. Yeah. I mean, there's more now than it was back then, but within Mm -hmm. the trailer or the mobile home park, there was, yeah, there was three known. Okay. Which, by the way, I have checked this. I don't check it all the time, but, like, I do check it at least once a year. There's a sex offender registry that you can Google for your state. Mm -hmm. And you just put in your address, and it'll literally show you all the sex offenders that live near you. What? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, it's called the National Sex Offender Public Website. The address is nsopw.gov. I can literally search by location right now. Florida. I won't say my town or anything, but I'm going to put it in. And I'll let you know. It's very easy to use. Alright, so... For my area, I have nine sex offenders within a mile of where I live. And it shows you their picture, their name, their address. It comes in handy. Mm-hmm. So just let just letting all, you, all y'all know out there. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. So there was a statement released by the police on the suspect they were looking for. It's a white male, loner, or social marginal. Menial job, low pay, low skill. They may have changed their appearance or have been anxious or suddenly left town around August 16th to October 6th. And they may have been paying close attention to the case in media. Um, They were familiar with the Ataga or (laughs) Atuga, either one, Mm -hmm. Uh, wildlife management area. They may have been a possible hunter, as it was in a remote spot that they found her body. And they could be from Prattville or very familiar with the area. They first thought they'd be looking for an older male, but now they weren't sure. A white male between the ages of 35 to 45 with a distinctive mole on his face. However, the drawing that was used for 16 years was wrong and didn't find the composition reliable as it was based from children. Did you want to elaborate on that chick? <laughs> the that chick. child? Yeah, that I That led mean, on this fabrication? Yeah, like we mentioned in the beginning. Like, yeah. if she came forward... Well, I don't know if she came forward or if they just... If the police actually just, like, went back to her house or whatever because they were reinvestigating. Mm -hmm. But either way, she eventually told them that she made it up. She made everything up. So So if they hadn't went over there, she wouldn't have said anything? That is a possibility because I don't know if she actually went to the police or if she only said something because they went to her. Mm. Yeah. So if it was the latter... That's despicable. I'm sorry. That's horrible. Like, you already let that... I realized she were a child. Or she was a child. I don't know if she's listening to this. But I realized that she was a child when she said that. I mean, but even at that point, I'm like, (laughs) why? I don't know. But anyway. But, like, once you become an adult, take responsibility. Like, you... It went on for 16 years. I just... I don't understand it. I really don't. 
So it, it does make me wonder, though, like, which one it was. Because it, like, she did wait so long to say something. So I wonder if she did only say something because the police were reinvestigating the case. Mm -hmm. Or maybe hmm. she didn't I don't know, know how to approach it. And she's like, oh, well, since you're here. Could be. Could be, yeah. Either way, I'm glad that she finally admitted it. Mm-hmm. Um, because now they can get away from that sketch and, like, focus on other things. Other, you know, other suspects. Can you imagine it's, like, this random Joe at some diner eating a burger? <laughs> That's him! No. It's the mole! It's you! <laughs> oh my god. In 2006, a report was released. It had findings of the behaviors of killers, such as their age range and possible job to how they react to the media. It also stated which those they preyed upon, which would be young girls around the ages of 10 to 12. What I found interesting was the victim-to-killer relationship that they had at the time. The fact that it was a stranger was around 44%, a friend or acquaintance, 41%, and family or intimate, 13%, which would change if the killer abductor had done this previously, where the chances of it being a stranger had jumped to 71%. That's actually really interesting because nowadays it's opposite. Nowadays they found out that it's much more likely you're killed by somebody you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. to put that out there. Yeah, the whole report, I mean, this is just obviously a little snippet, but if you mm -hmm. go through the report, it's just all the numbers and the, I just, yeah. And it was back then and then to only imagine how it is now. Yeah. That's crazy. People are crazy, Kim. I know, man. I know. Shannon's murder could also possibly be linked to a serial killer, as there were two other cases that had striking similarities to that of Shannon as they were abducted from their trailer parks where they resided. The girls' disappearances were two years apart and happened in August. Teresa Melissa Dean, missing on August 15, 1999, was last seen walking to a friend's house. Shannon Nicole Polk, August 16th, 2001, last seen walking home by a neighbor. Heaven Lachey Ross, August 19th, 2003, was last seen walking to a bus stop when she went missing, and she was later found in an abandoned building. So all in August, all two years apart, yeah. all young girls, and it was all, they were all in Alabama or like yeah. the general area? Alabama, but yeah, general area. Like, I don't think they were that far from each other. Wow, that's interesting. And that's why they want to tie it to a serial killer, but I'm like, but you haven't really heard too much after that. It was just mainly those three, but... Yeah. Even so, I mean, I can see why they'd want to rope it into something like that. Yeah, I mean, I could definitely see the pattern and why they want to kind of categorize it into that. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, without actual evidence of it i'm still under my thoughts are still it was somebody that she knew yeah and going back to the walker thing like i guess the reason why some people think she was abducted right by that neat halloween man's house right mm -hmm. and by the road is because the walker was there laying like laying in the street um and it makes sense right because like those things are heavy if she was walking home she would want she would have wanted to go to her house and at least drop it off you yeah. know because like why would you want to be walking around with a baby walker so i feel like she maybe was on her way home to go and drop it off and then she got abducted mm -hmm. on the way i mean the evidence kind of matches that in a way yeah but again it's like it's hard to say there's just so many I feel like there's so many suspects in this case, and there's just not enough evidence. In your research, did you ever find something about, like, was any DNA evidence found on her? No. I, di I didn't come across anything like that. We didn't come across that? Mm -mm. Alright, let me look that up real quick, because I, I don't remember if they said anything about that. I know with the other girl they did. The one that was found in an abandoned building, but... Really? Not okay. Shannon, yeah. Not Shannon. 
Yeah, it's quite sad how they found her, but it was also yeah. not to say expected, but it is expected on how just because of how females are treated in general. Mm-hmm. You do have like those very, very rare cases where a child goes missing for like years too, or mm-hmm. months, years, and then they are found alive. Yeah. But that is so rare. It is so rare to have that. But I guess if you're a parent, like, you still always have that hope, Mm -hmm. you know? Of course. Until something, yeah, yeah, until something is actually found. Yeah, I don't think I came across anything about DNA either. Mm -hmm. So either they didn't find anything on her body or they're just keeping that under wraps. Yeah. And that could be, that could be it too. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it also seems like they're withholding stuff, but... Yeah, I mean, there's, like, a lot of holes in this case. Agree. But there's also, like, a good chunk that's out there as well. It's like they, it's like a give and take sort of thing. Um, Right. Where they're just, it's out there just enough to to keep you satisfied, but they still have, it seems they still have more evidence to unveil. Yeah, that they're holding on to, which, which honestly I think is a good thing because... If they do ever find Shannon's killer, Mm -hmm. um, that'll kind of seal the deal with that. Because it won't be public knowledge about what they found. You know what I mean? But it kind of reminds me in a way, except Kyron was never found yet, of the Kyron Horman case. Where because it's still an an active case, there are just things that we don't know about the case yet. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? No. It's been 22 years since Shannon's life was viciously cut short. Shannon's family deserves justice. Shannon deserves justice. A tree was planted in Pratt Park years ago with a marker to honor Shannon. It has since grown and flourished tremendously, just like Shannon would have if she hadn't met a monster that fateful day. I'll leave you with a statement from Marie, Shannon's mother. Shannon was her beautiful daughter, and every moment she had with her was her favorite memory. Shannon was the sweetest, kindest, most loving daughter with the most beautiful heart. She loved everyone. She was beautiful inside and out. She was a child of God. Shannon had a beautiful soul. This case is still open and active. There is a $20,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of Shannon's killer. If you have any information on this case, please contact the Prattville Police Department at 334-595-0208 or the FBI or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. All right, Mystery Knox listeners, that's it for today's episode. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this case, so send us a message on Instagram or YouTube at Mystery Knox Podcast, on Twitter at Mystery Knox Pod, or send us a voice message on Spotify. The link can be found in the description. A list of our sources and photos mentioned in this episode can be found on our blog at mysteryknoxpodcast.wordpress.com. Your support is always appreciated, so if you've enjoyed our podcast, please let us know by giving us a rating, a review, and a follow on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'll see you on our next episode, and remember, stay weird, stay curious. A little more than one would. More specifically. (laughs) Oh my god. Oh my god. It's like I just ran out of air. (sighs) Okay. Like a balloon to flee. Exactly. (laughs) And that's the end of the podcast. We'll see you next week, guys. And we're done, people. We're done. (laughs)